Chapter Three of Curiosities of Olden Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Noel Badrian. Curiosities of Olden Times by Sabine Baring Gould. Chapter Three: Strange Wills. Of course, we ought to begin with Adam's will the father of all wills and if we could produce that patriarchal document we should undoubtedly find in it the germs of all the merits faults and eccentricities of wills to come but unfortunately though a testament of adam does exist it is a forgery and nothing will convince us to the contrary not even the mussulman tradition which asserts that on the occasion of our great forefather beginning to make his bequests seventy legions of angels brought him sheets of paper and quill pens nicely nibbed all the way from paradise and that the archangel gabriel set to his seal as witness what four hundred and twenty thousand sheets of paper surely a needless consumption of material when there was nothing to bequeath but a view over the hedge of an impractical garden. If we pass on to Noah's testament, we are again among the Apocrypha. In it, Noah portions his landed property, the globe, into three shares, one for each son. America is not included in the division, for obvious reasons. It was left for manners' sake and manners has never got it the testament of the twelve patriarchs must be glanced at which is received as semi-canonical by the armenian church though it is unquestionably apocryphal reuben speaks of sleep as having been in paradise only a sweet ecstasy whereas after the fall it has become a continually recurring image of death Simeon bewails his former hostility to Joseph, and relates that his brother's bones were preserved in the royal treasury of Egypt. Levi is oracular. Judah rejoices in the sceptre left to his race. Issachar unfolds the future of the Jews. Zebulun relates that the brethren supplied themselves with shoes from the money which they got by the sale of Joseph. There seems to be some allusion to this tradition in the prophet Amos, chapter 2, verse 6, and chapter 8, verse 6. Dan recommends his posterity to practice humility. Naphtali sees visions. Gad is contrite. Asher prophesies the coming of the Messiah. Joseph, the incarnation. Benjamin, the destruction of the temple. There exists a very curious and ancient testament of Job, which was discovered and published by Cardinal Mai in 1839. It relates many details which we may look for in vain in the canonical book. In it, Job's faithful wife, when reduced to the utmost poverty, sells the hair of her head to procure bread for her husband. What a remarkable document a will is! It is the voice of a man now dead, coming back in the hush of a darkened house, from the vault, low and hoarse as an echo. It speaks, and people hearken, it commands, and people obey, law supports and enforces its wishes, no power on earth can alter it. We expect to hear the voice calm, earnest, and speaking true judgment, terrible indeed if it breaks out with a snarl of hate more terrible still if it gibbers and laughs a hollow ghost-like laugh for surely the most solemn moment of a life is that when the will is written that will which is to speak for man when the voice is passed as a dream when the heart which devises it has ceased to throb the head which frames it has done with thinking under the fresh mound the hand with pens it has been pressed thin and white against a cold shroud to moulder with it surely he who at such a moment can write words of hate must have a black heart but he who ventures then to gibe and jest 
must have no heart at all. There is some truth in the old ghost creed. Man can return after death. He does so in his will. He comes to some, as Jupiter came to Dane, in a shower of gold, to others as a blighting spectre whose promised treasure turns to dust. What excitement the reading of a will causes in a family, and what interest does the world at large take in the bequest of a person of position? The last words of great men seem always to have possessed a peculiar value in the eyes of the people. Live, Brutus, live, shouts the Roman mob in Julius Caesar. But on hearing what Caesar's will promises, how to every Roman citizen he gives, to every several man, seventy-five drachmas, his private arbors and new-planted orchids on this side of Tiber, he hath left them you and to your heirs for ever. Then the mob changes note, and with one voice shouts, To Brutus, to Cassius, burn all! Testamenta ominum speculum esse morum vulgo credito. Pliny the Younger. Essays, Volume 8, Section 18. So they are. They are the last touch of the brush, in the great picture of civilization, manners, and customs, lightening it up would that space permitted me to enter into the history of wills a few curious particulars alone can we admit to die without having made a will was formerly regarded with horror a very common custom in the middle ages was that of leaving considerable benefactions to the church this was well enough but the clergy were not satisfied until it was made compulsory Ducanage says that neglect of leaving to the church indicated a profanity which deserved punishment by a refusal of the rites of the last sacraments and burial. The clergy of Brittany in the 14th century claimed a third of the household goods. The deathbed became ecclesiastical property in the diocese of Auxerre, and Clement V settled the claims of the church by deciding that the parish priest might take as his perquisite a ninth of all the movables in the house of the dead man, after the debts of the deceased had been paid off. A sufficiency of historical notes. I will proceed at once, perhaps somewhat strangely, to give the reader a specimen of a will coming decidedly under the heading of this article. It is that of a pig. The will is ancient enough. S. Jerome, in his Proemium on Isaiah, speaks of it, saying that in his time, 4th century, children were wont to sing it at school amidst shouts of laughter. Alexander Prasicanus, who died in 1539, was the first to publish it. He found it in a manuscript at Mayence. Later, G. Fabricius gave a corrected edition of it from another manuscript found at Memel and since then it has been in the hands of the learned. The original is in Latin. I translate, modifying slightly one expression, and omitting one bequest. I, M. Grunius Corocota Porcellus, have made my testament, which, as I can't write myself, I have dictated. Says Magirus the cook, Come along thou who turnest the house topsy-turvy, spoiler of the pavement, O oh, fugitive Porcellus, I am resolved to slaughter thee to-day. Says Coracotta Porcellus, If ever I have done thee any wrong, if I have sinned in any way, if I have smashed any wee pots with my feet, O oh, Master Cook, grant pardon to thy suppliant. Says the cook, Magirus, Halloo, boy, go bring me a carving-knife out of the kitchen, that I may make a bloody Porcellus of him. Porcellus is caught by the servants and brought out to execution on the 16th before the Lucernine Calends, just when young colwort sprouts are in plenty, Clybaratus and Piperatus being consuls. Now, when he saw that he was about to die, he begged hard of the cook an hour's grace, just to write his will. He called together his relations, that he might leave to them some of his victuals, and he said, I will and bequeath to my papa, Verinus Lardinus, 
thirty bushels of acorns. I will and bequeath to my mamma, Veturina Scrofa, forty bushels of Laconian corn. I will and bequeath to my sister, Quirona, at whose nuptials I may not be present, thirty bushels of barley. Of my mortal remains I will and bequeath my bristles to the cobblers, my teeth to the squabblers, my ears to the deaf, my tongue to the lawyers and chatterboxes, my entrails to tripe men, my hams to gluttons, my stomach to little boys, my tail to little girls, my muscles to effeminate parties, my heels to runners and hunters, my claws to thieves, and to a certain cook, whom I won't mention by name, I bequeath the cord and stick which I brought with me from my oak grove to the sty, in hopes that he may take the cord and hang himself with it. I will that a monument be erected to me, inscribed with this in golden letters. M. Grunius Corocota Porcellus, who lived 999 years, six months more and he would have been 1,000 years old. Friends, dear to me whilst I lived, I pray you to have a kindness towards my body, and embalm it well with good condiments, such as almonds, pepper and honey, that my name may be named through ages to come. O oh, my masters and my comrades, who have assisted at the drawing up of this testament, order it to be signed, signed Lucanius, Silsanus, Pergilus, Lardio, Mistaliacus, Ophelicus, Cymatus. Whilst on this subject we might say a word about the epitaph on the mule of P. Crassus, or about that written by Rapine on the ass, which, poor fellow, was eaten whilst in the flower of his age during the siege of Paris in 1590, or about Joachim du Bellay, who composed an epitaph on his cat, or about Justus Lipsius, who erected mausoleums for his three cats, Mopsus, Saphisus, and Mopsulus. But we are not writing on epitaphs or gravestones. We proceed to give a few instances of animals which have received legacies. If it is a keen trial for a husband to leave his wife or a young man to be taken from his pleasures, or a commercial man from his business, can we wonder at old ladies feeling the wrench sharp which tears them from the society of their dear cats, the companions of their spinsterhood or widowhood, or at old bachelors being distressed at having to part with their faithful dogs? To part with them forever, too, unless we believe in the suggestion of Bishop Butler and Theodore Parker, that there is a future for beasts, and enjoy the confidence of Mr. Sewell of Exeter College, who dedicated one of his published poems to my pony in heaven. The Count de Ramirandol, who died in 1825, left a legacy to his favourite carp, which he had nourished for twenty years in an antique fountain standing in his hall. In low life we find the same love for an animal displayed by a peasant of Toulouse, in 1781, who doted on his old chestnut horse and left the following will. I declare that I institute my chestnut horse sole legatee, and I wish him to belong to my nephew N. This testament was attacked, but, curiously enough, it received legal confirmation. The following clause was in a will in the English papers for March 1828. I leave to my monkey, my dear amusing Jakku, the sum of ten pounds sterling to be enjoyed by him during his life. It is to be expended solely in his keep. I leave to my faithful dog, Shock, and to my beloved cat, Tib, five pounds sterling apiece, as yearly pension. In the event of the death of one of the aforesaid legatees, the sum due to him shall pass to the two survivors, and on the death of one of these two, to the last, be he who he may. After the decease of all parties, the sum left them shall belong to my daughter, G, to whom I show this preference above all my children, 
because she has a large family and finds a difficulty in filling their mouths and educating them but a more curious case still is that of mr barclay of knightsbridge who died fifth of may eighteen o five he left a pension of twenty five pounds per annum to his four dogs this singular individual had spent the latter part of his life wrapped in the society of his curs on whom he lavished every mark of affection when any one ventured to remonstrate with him for expending so much money on their maintenance or suggested that the poor were more deserving of sympathy than those mongrel pups he would reply men assailed my life dogs preserved it this was a fact for mr b had been attacked by brigands in italy and had been rescued by his dog whose descendants the four pets were when he felt his end approaching he had his four dogs placed on couches by the sides of his bed he received their last caresses extended to them his faltering hand and breathed his last between their paws according to his desire the bust of these favoured brutes were sculpted at the corners of his tomb. In sixteen seventy seven died Madame Dupuy, who, under her maiden name of Mademoiselle Jean Felix, had been known as a great musician. Her will was so extraordinary and malicious that it was nullified. To it was attached a memorandum, which is still more extraordinary. We shall not quote the passages wherein she vilifies her son-in-law, imputing to him every vice she can think of, but translate the final clause. I pray Mademoiselle Bluteau, my sister, and Madame Calogne, my niece, to take care of my cats. Whilst these two live, they shall have thirty sous a month, that they may be well fed. They must have, twice a day, meat soup of the quality usually served on table but they must be given it separately, each having his own saucer. The bread must not be crumbled in the soup, but cut up into pieces about the size of hazelnuts, or they cannot eat it. When boiled beef is put into the pot with the soaked bread, some thin slices of raw meat must be put in as well, and the whole stewed till it is fit for eating. When only one cat lives, half the money will suffice. Nicole Pigeon shall take care of the cats and cherish them. Madame Calogne may go and see them. Certainly people show their love in different ways. Councillor Winslow of Copenhagen, died 24th of June, 1811, ordered by will that his carriage horses should be shot to prevent their falling into the hands of cruel masters. We need only mention the cat and dog money which is yearly given to six poor weavers widows of the names of fabry or ovington at christchurch spitalfields and which according to tradition was left in the first instance for the support of cats and dogs and remind our readers of the cow and bull benefactions in several english parishes where money has been left to the parish to provide cattle whose milk may go to the poor the poor have often been remembered by testators, as our numerous almshouses, benefactions and doles prove. It were difficult to choose a better example of a charitable bequest which could properly come under our title than the following simple and touching will of a French priest. Jean Certain, curé of a little parish in the Côte d'Or, who died in 1740, worth some 1,200 pounds i brought with me nothing into my parish but my cassock and braviary these i leave to my heirs the rest i bequeath to the poor of my parish wives poor bodies do not come off well for a crabbed husband will sometimes control and torment his good woman after he is dead and buried or even play a bitter jest as did one man who left his wife five hundred guineas but with the stipulation that she was not to enjoy it till after her death when the sum was to be expended on her funeral or as the author of the following since i have had the misfortune of having had to wife elizabeth m who since our marriage has tormented me in a thousand ways 
and since not content with showing her contempt for my advice she has done everything that lay in her power to render my life a burden to me so that heaven seems only to have sent her into the world for the purpose of getting me out of it the sooner and since the strength of samson the genius of homer the prudence of augustus the skill of pyrrhus the patience of job the subtlety of hannibal the vigilance of hermogenes would not suffice to tame the perversity of her character and since nothing can change her though we have lived separately for eight years without my having gained anything by it but the loss of my son whom she has spoilt and whom she has persuaded to abandon me altogether weighing carefully and attentively all these considerations i have bequeathed and do bequeath to the aforesaid elizabeth m my wife one shilling the clause in shakespeare's will must not be forgotten i give unto my wife my second best bed with the furniture and nothing else we hope that this was not intended as a spiteful jest but men are irritable and women are so trying the best bed would not have been a bad gift as the grand four-poster was an expensive article in elizabethan days but the second best seems rather a paltry legacy however as we are perfectly sure to have the noble army of shakespearean commentators down upon us if we venture to impute other than the highest and purest of motives to their idol for the sake of peace we are perfectly willing to believe the bed to have been the most valuable gift that could have been made that sovereigns roses and angels were stitched into the coverlets and stuffed into the pillows just as the miser tolum bequeathed to my sister-in-law four old stockings which are under my bed on the right item to my nephew tarles two more old stockings item to lieutenant john stone a blue stocking and my red cloak item to my cousin an old boot and a red flannel pocket item to hammock my jug without a handle imagine the disgust of the legatees till hammock kicking the jug smashed it and out rolled a quantity of sovereigns the stockings boot and flannel pocket were soon seized now and found to be as auriferous as the old pot now why should not the second best bed left to mrs shakespeare have been as valuable a bequest whilst talking about beds let us not forget a very odd story in the earlier part of this century there lived in the neighbourhood of caen a juge de paix monsieur Halloin, a great lover of tranquillity and ease so much so indeed that as bed is the article of furniture most adapted to repose he rarely quitted it but made his bedchamber a hall of audience in which he exercised his functions of justice of peace pronouncing sentence with his head resting on a pillow and his body languidly extended on the softest of feather beds however his services were dispensed with and he devoted himself for the remaining six years of his life to still greater ease feeling his end approach monsieur Halloin determined on remaining constant to his principle and showing to the world to what an extent he carried his passion for bed consequently his last will contained a clause expressing his desire to be buried at night in his bed comfortably tucked in with pillows and coverlets as he had died as no opposition was raised against the execution of this clause a huge pit was sunk and the defunct was lowered into his last resting place without any alteration having been made in the position in which death had overtaken him boards were laid over the bed that the falling earth might not disturb this imperturbable quietist many testators have directions for the treatment of their bodies some are over solicitous for their preservation while others choose to show their contempt for that body which after all will rise again dr ellaby the quaker for instance bequeathed his lungs to one friend and his brains to another with a threat that he would haunt them if they refused to accept the legacy 
others from motives of humility act somewhat similarly the emperor maximilian i willed that his hair should be shorn and his teeth brayed in a mortar and then burned publicly in his chapel also that his body should be buried in a sack with quicklime beneath the footpace of the altar of st georges at neustadt so that his heart might be beneath the celebrant's feet his intentions were carried out at the time but afterwards his remains were translated to innsbruck and they now lie under that goodly monument raised by ferdinand i his deeds graven tenderly in white marble about him and eight and twenty mighty bronze paladins and princes standing guard about the choir wherein he sleeps if some folk leave injunctions about their bodies others are particular about their names henry green for instance by will dated twenty second of december sixteen seventy nine gave to his sister catherine green during her life all his lands in melbourne derby and after her decease to others in trust upon condition that the said catherine green should give four green waistcoats to four poor women in a green old age every year such green waistcoats to be lined with green galloon lace and to be delivered to the said poor women on or before the twenty first of december yearly that they might be worn on christmas day that the good men do may live after them at least on their tombstones has induced some to leave money as bribes to the writers of their epitaphs the abbe de la riviere son of an appraiser of wood who became bishop duke of langres devised one hundred ecus for that purpose but la monnoy wrote the following here lies a notable personage of family proud of ancient lineage his virtues unnumbered his knowledge profound remarkably humble remarkably wise come come for twenty-five pounds i've told enough lies another clause in the abbe's will deserves to be recorded from its pithiness to my steward i leave nothing because he has been in my service for eighteen years this reminds one of an anecdote told of the cardinal dubois whose servants came to him every new year's day to present their congratulations and to receive a new year's box when the steward came in his turn the cardinal said to him monsieur i present you with all that you have stolen from me the pleasure of receiving a legacy must be generally mingled with pain more or less intense according to the nearness of relationship of the deceased or the affection we have had for him but when a plump legacy drops into our laps from a totally unexpected quarter and left by one for whom we did not care or possibly whom we did not know the amount of pain must be very minute such a case was that of a lady who came in for a large fortune from an eccentric individual to whom she had never spoken though she had seen him at the opera or in the park the wording of the will was i supplicate miss b to accept my whole fortune too feeble an acknowledgment of the inexpressible sensations which the contemplation of her adorable nose has produced on me the following is as curious a good citizen of paris who died about seventeen seventy nine inserted this clause in his will item i leave to monsieur l'abbe thirty thousand men twelve hundred livres a year i do not know him by any other name but he is an excellent citizen who certified me in the luxembourg that the english that ferocious people which dethrones its monarchs will soon be destroyed on opening the testament the executors were sorely puzzled to know who this abbe thirty thousand men could possibly be at last several people deposed that this citizen a sworn enemy of the english and a great politician had been wont every day to march up and down the allee des lames in the luxembourg there he used to meet with an abbe who had as great an abhorrence of the english as himself and who was perpetually urging 
those english rascals aren't worth a straw thirty thousand men only are wanted thirty thousand men raised thirty thousand embarked thirty thousand landed and london would be in the hands of thirty thousand men a mere trifle this was verified and the legacy was delivered over to the intrepid abbe who had little dreamed of the spoil his thirty thousand men were to bring him there is a question which we have been asking ourselves repeatedly and which we now put before the reader is it possible to classify these wills we have tried to do so and have failed in every attempt first we have distributed them according to the bequests contained in them legacies of money goods animals persons there is no reason which can justify such an arbitrary system then again when we arrange them according to the motives of the testator as wills indicted by a perverted moral sense or those composed under the influence of an aberration of the intellect then we are obliged to exclude that of Corocotta Porcellus, of Jean Certain, besides many others, which can hardly be forced into position under either of these heads. And it is because the mind of man is too intricate, his motives too involved, his feelings too transient, his principles too obscure, for us to divide and subdivide the actions springing from them, as we can settle the classes of mollusks or determine the genera of butterflies that in this paper we have attempted nothing of the kind for wills are as has been shown as diverse as the hearts of men of which they are the transcripts an anatomist may dissect the heart may name and register every muscle and fibre but he can tell us nothing of the motives which impelled that heart to throb faster or chilled it to a sudden stillness the bitterness of hate has left no poison in its cavities in it the fleeting passion has set no seal emotion left no trace pity relaxed no nerve the impulses which brought forth so full a leafage of action are lost as the sap from the bare tree so surely as the berry indicates the soundness of the root the flower of the bulb so does man's last will tell of the goodness or foulness of the heart which conceived it the cankered root sends up only a sickly germ which brings forth no fruit in due season whilst the wine that maketh glad the heart of man the oil which maketh him a cheerful countenance and the bread that strengthens his heart have burst from roots which mildew has never marred nor worm fretted End of chapter 3 Recording by Noel Badrian, County Offaly, Ireland